happen. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm gonna start. Ours is going live. I'm gonna do an intro and get this this puppy going. Hey everybody, thanks for stopping by. We got nine people here. I think this is like the most we've ever had at the start of one. Today we have you have forty people on your side. Sorry, we have. Um, I'm gonna introduce them so we can just switch over. We have Artem and Johnny, um, two people I've worked with last year, and we can switch over to see their view now. And Artem's gone. <laughs> oh, sorry, I just liked. Hello, everybody. Hey. Um. So you said we had forty people on your side. It's still yeah. It's going to be more. <laughs> Why is it going to be more? I asked Putin to like call everybody in the Russia so they're gonna join us in the chat. So we're gonna get taken down like immediately. No, nope. we're totally good. Okay, so this is an interesting setup. We're doing a dual stream. So Artem is also streaming to all of his Russian fan base because he's a massive big vlogger in the <laughs> Russian space. I do like your vlogs a lot. How long do they take? Because they seem like they're gonna take like like weeks to make all of the like little motion graphics you add to them. It's actually not that kind of like effort. It it depends of the like the mm, motivation I have. Like sometimes when I, so for example when I just moved to USA, Johnny knows like I had like almost every week I had a vlog just because like I was so excited to be here. And then like last year he did all like really hard and I was I wasn't able to like motivate myself to 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 make it. And basically, I just every vlog I did kind of like After Effects template with the old titles, all the ideas, and some of the ideas with a lot of CG. They they were like year ago or something, so it was basically just like on top of the current ideas. But thank you for your like you were able to to watch the whole Russian. I, I mean, yeah, I got to put the CCs on and like read essentially your video, but. Every now and then, there's like that one little American word. We just you have subtitles now. He did. Uh, uh, yeah, on some of them. Yeah. Uh, whereas, uh, so you know, Doug was actually in two of my vlogs, and I had to do uh, the Russian subtitles in English as well. We just got donate from Adolf Hitler. Sorry, guys. Yeah, it it was nickname. <laughs> rough Jeez. okay let's introduce each other <laughs> or you can introduce Every yourself so johnny introduce yourself kind of for anyone that doesn't know you that's coming here kind of who you are and what you do and where you are and then we can have Artem do it and then we can get going sure so uh my name's john lapore i'm the chief creative director at a studio called perception uh, through working at Perception, I've had the opportunity to work with a whole bunch of super talented artists, including these two gentlemen that I'm talking to right now. Yeah. Yeah. I worked with you guys almost the entirety of last year. <laughs> Just per yeah, month. For, uh, well, you were, yeah, you were working with us, I think, through all of all of 2020. You were working with us right I started like Jan twenty first, yeah. And okay. then like went all the way to like December fifteenth. So nearly the entire year. Yeah. 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 That, that was uh and and yeah, wild ride to kind of, you know, stay with us through the going remote and mm -hmm. uh and all of that. But uh yeah, it's been been awesome having, you know, I, I feel very fortunate that the last year was busy enough that we had uh, mm -hmm. enough work going on and that we also had, you know, it's really nice for me that when we have freelancers, we have some folks that can stick around for a long haul because I think it helps, mm -hmm. you know, I, I hope it was helpful for you to kind of get into like the mind space of how we do what we do. And, mm -hmm. and you obviously had some long runs on some projects, but also got to like bounce around and see, uh, I think, a you know, a pretty well-rounded view of what we do at Perception. Yeah, I think I touched like both sides of that slider where it was like automotive all the way to like feature film stuff in like the lightest like supporting way. But like even to parts where like for some reason one day I had like two hours and someone needed like a little bit of a help on like a VFX like key in a shot. So it's just like, okay spend like two hours trying to help that like green screen like get keyed out better and then jump back onto something else and it's like just very weirdly like 
everybody being able to support each other is like a a cool thing about the space because everyone's pretty much like pretty rounded and like all generalists because there's so many problems so it's hard to like have like you know i mean there's some people that are insanely good at some specific stuff but everyone seems to have like a good base knowledge but artem okay uh, that's where i met you was we started our jan 21st of last year and there are all these crazy russians there doing all their crazy russian hack and ui <laughs> but yeah uh, Vlad, Vlad was there as well right you, you, mm -hmm. had, yeah. you had the pleasure to meet that guy I, I did have the 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 esteemed honor of meeting vlad <laughs> It's always referred to as the pleasure of meeting <laughs> Vlad. No, I also had the pleasure of working with Vlad and then realizing that I'm just uber, uber slow when I was like, here's my one idea. He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Here's 25 ideas that I had in the past like five minutes that I cooked up. And I was like, okay, cool. Yeah, and he, and he does it while he's being yeah. with his mother and wife in back in Moldova. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, how did you start to work with Perception, Artem? I guess Jeremy approached me when I was uh, having fun in my hometown in <laughs> in Russia, and I was working for you, Johnny, freelancing for a couple of projects. Right? It was Nike and GM, probably. It was something automotive, and I was really shocked by like like I can do actual stuff which work in life. I mean, the people are gonna use that, not just mm. like watching my cute videos and stuff <laughs> and then i got a offer from jeremy and i came to america it was like i still like it, feel like i'm tourist and stuff but yeah the it's basically they just found me online and i shoot email in motiongrapher.com and here we are in the same <laughs> glasses in the same glasses <laughs> I have those glasses too. I'm just not wearing them. <laughs> I had a like because of the pandemic. I wore this oh, no. shit for like for couple like couple months. Because, are those like, like readers or cheaters? What are those? I don't know. I broke those things and I I couldn't like uh, go get my new glasses. And I was wearing. Can you imagine like speaking with the client? Like hello guys. Like here's my <laughs> ideas. So, can yeah, you imagine yeah. that, Johnny? It can could be, you? It could be glasses or a belt. <laughs> I, I don't wear belts. Hmm. Okay, good. Okay. I don't like this silence when I, like I do like stupid jokes and you like <laughs> fuck your face. Have... And everybody in the chat in Russian chat like they <laughs> they supporting me. This is. This <laughs> can... <laughs> I'm just I'm. I'm... I'm stalling out because I have so many, like I haven't talked to you in so long, Artem, and I have so many like memories and stories and, and thoughts that come That's to mind. That's why I kind of wanted to bring you on as like a supporting role in like, cause I mean, like didn't, didn't Artem live with you or was that Vlad that lived with you or did they both live with you <laughs> at some point? <laughs> didn't they? No. No, no, there was uh, no nobody. Uh... Vlad Vlad lives with um, <laughs> uh, I forgot his name. He's working at Google now. He was in Jersey. Oh no, uh, Justin. God. He lived with Justin. Was, was, was yeah. Vlad staying with Justin? Yeah, for a couple of weeks. You know, like Vlad tend to be like uh, living in the all the boroughs of New York City. Yeah, he. I I always it's it's interesting because i feel like you you and vlad you both came to perception at a, around the same time and you seem to have this amazing experience where you like you went out <laughs> you found a russian landlord in the rockaways and you were like i've got an apartment that is by the beach and there's all these other russians that hang out there and i would talk to to vlad and he would just be like i'm renting a coffin that i sleep in at night and I hear terrible noises happening in like all the apartments that are all around me. And I have to leave in two more weeks and go to a different coffin where there's also horrible things happening all around. Uh, you know, I've seen many different people that have like, you know, come to come to New York and had a wide variety of experiences from like, hey, this is awesome to, uh, you know, oh, uh, I've got a, you know, I've got a land, I've got 
my landlord is also one of my roommates and is constantly like threatening all of the other roommates with violence and, you know, all sorts of like horrifying, terrible stuff that, you know, it's just, I guess that's, I guess that's New York. You kind of spin the wheel and see what you, you commuted get. from the Rockaways into Midtown every day. Yeah, but Johnny commutes from. I, mean, I know, I know, from New Jersey. <laughs> it's it's, it's like the same, further. like hour or something. But you have like cozy train with the beer in it, and I have yeah, a, yeah. I have a train with thirty-seven stops. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But, I mean, so... I spent the like in total. I I'm spent like two years in America and one year just being at, under pandemic at home. Mm. so yeah and as i told i i was still like a tourist and it for me it was fun to travel like every day hour in new york city and after some time yeah i was feeling bad because of it but it was still fun for me so yeah it wasn't a big deal so our hey guys what see you, what, you... Every... Uh, what? <laughs> Isaac, what do you what do you normally do on this stream? Is it normally chatting? Or are you normally like uh, going through project files and stuff? What? No, no. So these ones are just chatting and kind of like general questions about like getting caught up on like how artists got to where they are now um, and any kind of history about that, and then some just general questions about you know their future and like different things they're working on. But this is a little bit more interesting because. I've never I've only done a the two guests thing once and they were both like from the same sort of like they were both coworkers at Google. So this is a little bit Oh, you followed me eighteen hours ago. Is that you, O T V D? Yeah, okay. Me. Um but yeah, that's normally what it is. So like I don't know, however you guys want to approach it. We could just focus on Artem and Johnny can give fun little backstories because you've been with him like when he's came over to work with you guys, or it could go for both of you just However you want. All up I to can, you, Artem. I can go through the, like, the basic idea was to, like, compare freelance and office. And I had, like, a couple questions to Johnny. You spent, like, 15 years working in an office, right? You never freelance it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, did, I did freelance when I was very early in my career and bounced around a bunch of places. But, yeah, I've been, I've been married to Perception for a long time. Yeah, what, and, what like number but, higher were you? Because like I remember this like obviously like the the original two founders. Yeah, so I actually don't know what number higher I was, but uh, the studio opened in two thousand one, and I came aboard in February two thousand six as like a freelancer. Mm. I basically spent like a full year permalancing. And after, and there was a, you know, there was a few times where they were like, Hey, why don't you join full-time and whatnot? I was like, no, no, I gotta, I gotta sow my freelance oats. I gotta, you know, see the world and do all of that stuff. And after, you know, 10 or 11 months of that, I kind of realized like, well, I'm enjoying working here. Like I like the kind of projects that are coming through. I really liked the people that I was working with and enjoyed working with the owners and, and whatnot. And more than anything, I was really curious to kind of get a little deeper under the hood of mm. just how the business is run and how the creative process works from end to end and not just be like, all right, you know, we just want to pitch on project X. So start moving into the production on that. And I wanted to get a little more focused on like, well, what are, how are we coming up with these ideas in the first place? And how are we, you know, how are we working with the, the earliest seeds of the process with the clients and, and all of that. So uh, I jumped on uh, full time and kind of never, never looked back. And also just the environment at Perception, we tend to, it's, it's kind of been a cultural thing, like where we like to hand as much responsibility to team members as they can effectively handle. And so the owners kind of feeding me more and more responsibility um, like to, to an almost reckless, you know, degree. And, uh, and I loved that. I thought it was awesome. And it allowed me to kind of like level up really quickly and make my way from, you know, just being a, a freelance designer to being, you know, like the main designer at the studio and then the art director and the creative director and so on and so forth. Cool. How did you, Artem, how did you get into this? Like, what was like, was it like 
did you go to college for it or no and this is the main question i, I wanted to ask you you both uh went to design school right mm -hmm. and my first question so i i didn't and like west majority of russian designers didn't as well because mm -hmm. we just we didn't have them and we still don't have them and first question to journey oh and i just answered on that sorry i was asking like uh is it possible to person who didn't went to uh, go to design school became like creative director or like whatever top position on the design studio and i remember russ he never been to school right what uh did russ never go to school maybe i mean yeah absolutely like i don't i don't think anyone needs to go to school to do anything in this industry like if it helps you get there and it helps you level up your skills and get into the right mindset to be effective in this industry then that's great but uh i have hired many people over the years without even thinking to ask them about what their education was like like okay. it's it just it's and i i feel like it's we're in a really fortunate space um both as you know both in this industry but also just as like humans doing a job where i feel like your the amount of value that you bring to the table is very clear it's very mm -hmm. transparent it's very easy and i kind of you know i i attribute a lot of that to the fact that like working in this industry, I feel like there's always been, and, and I don't know what your guys' experiences have been like, but doing this work, which can be really difficult. I feel like there's always been really positive vibes around and everybody's pretty easy to work with or collaborate with because there's a whole lot of bullshit that doesn't need to exist that I think all is just surrounding like well, do I deserve to be in my position? How do I make sure other people know that I like deserve to be doing what I'm doing and whatnot? Like, it's all very transparent. It's all very clear. And we can all like tell from each other what we bring to the table. And I feel like it's, you know, uh, I, I even see like a big difference between like when you're working in a studio environment, there's, you know, your artists, and then you've got maybe like a production team or project managers or producers or whatnot. And those folks, uh, whether they're good or whether they're bad, they have a lot more kind of like bullshit that they have to deal with because mm -hmm. it's a lot harder to tell on that side of the fence, like who's really competent, who's really like making the projects work and flow and, right. and, and happen and whatnot. Yeah. It's a lot less, um, clear, like kind of things that you can check it by based on like, you know, output or like results from something where like a lot of us are just like kind of when you boil it down, just problem solvers. So it's like, can you solve the problem so you have solved the problems cool so you must be doing well or else like that wouldn't like we would have like issues and things wouldn't be getting done but on the other side it's like very dependent on like you know social things or like uh personable like issues with different things where like you know a director could just be like hard to work with so it's like not the producer's fault that this is like just not going like the way that they want it to or like you know a dry a client just like leaves and it's like oh well i mean it's like hard to pinpoint on like why these things are happening i mean even like i i tend to find especially when you're in a situation where uh there's like pitching going on and there's not there's almost never a situation where like a pitch is lost and then everybody's like oh well the people that worked on the pitch they lost the pitch like everybody's mm -hmm. still like no, actually the stuff we did, like we still thought it was cool because we can look at it. We can appreciate it. And be like, we just didn't get it. There's a yeah. number of different reasons why you don't get a pitch. And therefore like you're not evaluating the artist's worth based on, you know, well, are they, you know, bringing in specific amounts of business or are they whatever? It's a lot more just sort of like, well, do I like what they're making and what mm -hmm. they're doing and, and whatnot? Um, which uh, again, I'm I'm super thankful that in this industry, like that transparency exists. And I think it saves like a whole lot of like weird amorphous like ego baggage that that comes in in a lot of other workspaces. We got a question in the chat from Jeff. He says, "Do they rely on word of mouth or reels to find collaborators?" And I I would assume I could also say that that's probably like a question of like Johnny when you're looking like through the myriad of designers out there like what kind of like, I know that you reached out on Twitter and that's kind of how we started like 
I like perception was like a thing where I was like, oh yeah, they're like in New York too. Like you were just kind of like happened to reach out on DMs and be like, we would love to have you in like whenever that could work. And I was like, okay, cool. Like now you're on my radar. But yeah, I'm kind of, I'm sure Artem's following would also be pretty interested to see like what, how did you pick Artem? Like where did that come from? That kind of stuff. So when it comes to finding talent, um, I am almost always desperate to find talent like i am there's there is no singular stream or approach or whatnot that i that i take i wish i had a line out the door at all times of awesome talented uh people who are you know competent and savvy and available and and whatnot um, but for me, the fact of the matter is like, I'm, I'm just always on the hunt. It's really, for me, it's really difficult to find the right kind of people. Um, it's really difficult to find people that mesh with the very specific kind of stuff that we do at, at perception. And so to me, like I hunt for every Avenue, like we'll put an ad on motionographer and mm -hmm. we'll get a giant dump of resumes to filter through I'll hunt on Twitter or anywhere else, you know, looking for stuff i will ask everyone else on the team to help me with tracking folks down and and whatnot so uh for me it's it's always you know there's there's no particular avenue or technique that i'm dependent on it's it's all of them and you know the the best thing that happens is when people just you know reach out to us tell us you know uh ways that they think that they are, you know, applicable to the kind of work that, mm -hmm. that we do um, because I, I consider us to be relatively specialized and focused on, on some work. Um, and that's the thing that like, that makes me a, a happy boy or makes it a lot easier for me. But uh, quite frankly, uh, staffing and resourcing is one of the most important things that I do at Perception. And it's almost the single most difficult thing <laughs> that I do at perception that says a lot about how hard that is <laughs> not about anything else it's just like you have a lot of other things you're doing i'm curious artem kind of maybe you can like look back at when you did get like the offer to come freelance like what like what were you doing at the time that you think maybe like caught someone's eye or got you noticed was it like a reel that you had just like have you been putting out reels up till then did you have like a portfolio site mostly like Instagram, Twitter, like what were you kind of doing at that time? I guess the biggest thing I had and I still have it's showreel. And I don't have like proper website and I have like pretty Behance page or I'm not active in Twitter because like I got Twitter a couple months ago, mm. first first time for me. <laughs> and I guess showreel worked. I mean, Johnny can tell like I, I don't know who like who chose me, but probably <laughs> it's this pretty young man. So uh, I think Jeremy had passed me your stuff, and I forget what it was. It was probably like your Behance page or something, and uh, um, and we're just like, yeah, it seems pretty cool. And uh, I think we we brought you on 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 some projects. I know. I think the very first one that we brought you on was maybe the the top secret nike thing that we did a while back but that was uh that was probably like a super challenging project and i think for us we were like all right well let's see if he if he can nail this one then uh then let's talk about having him come over and, and join join the team in new york yeah and, and uh, you did a great job i'm pretty sure you found like you went on behance and then found somebody else that you paid to do the job for you or, <laughs> right yeah, yeah, that's how it works. Because like you, you realized that when I came to Perception, right? <laughs> <laughs> he was outsourcing and, it all on Fiverr and just you know, yep, yeah. praying that it would. And all looking work. back into this super secret project and the time we're living in now, the yeah, year... I don't, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to get into it. But yeah, it's <laughs> very, uh, yeah, it's did, bizarre. Um, did Artem have to? stay in that super secret like room where they don't get to see sunlight and they have their phones outside was it that top secret or no i told you i was uh, living in my hometown i uh, already wasn't uh just in, in the yeah this was without it's, sunlight 
it's super top secret stuff, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't at that level. Um, and yeah, it was something that, that Artem was able to help us out with, uh, on the other side of the world. Yeah. And the whole situation with perception for me was so excited because like, Hey, Americans approached me a super secret project. <laughs> I, I spoke to Johnny first time. And I, I, I remember s- like, I was sweating like a fat pig. Sorry, Johnny. No, I mean, <laughs> no, I didn't mean that, but <laughs> it was really excited, exciting to speak to American guy and get, uh, got this like huge project. And I was like Googling how to properly said the redshift render how to like uh, and everything like uh, yet perception for me was for the first time like spider-man and this kind of like huge project for me was for the first time and one of the questions johnny for you was like as the seniors uh, in uh, perception doug and you you have to deal with guys like me like they came from uh overseas they barely speak english they kind of i was new to to the this kind of like uh amount of work and organization and i saw people struggling because of that and how you dealing with this i mean you you like i learned from you and from doug a lot and now i have the at least i have a notebook at the least of notes before it was like okay okay i'll do and two days later he asked me why you didn't do that oh i just forgot (laughs) sorry so uh i mean you you touch on a few different things one of which is just being you know generally incompetent and not remembering to write down the notes that are being given to you so i'm glad that you're uh i'm glad you took that away from your experience at, at perception um the the other thing you touch on is like there's a lot of especially when we're working on a film project you mentioned spider-man far from home there's a ton of crazy technical stuff that comes into the process with how you're packaging how you're formatting how you're arranging you know how you're organizing your your projects and and delivering the the files and the renders and whatnot and that stuff is so critical um, that if you're not doing any of that stuff, it kind of like clogs up the pipes or, or screws up the whole system as a whole. And the, the good news is, is that stuff is just, it's just basic following directions. It's just that there's a lot of directions to follow. And we're all, you know, especially as creative artists, we're maybe a little used to taking liberties with some of those directions or guidance that's that's provided to us and so i think for for us in the studio the hardest thing is just making sure that people understand that like there's parts of this where you can have fun and you can express yourself and you can solve problems in new and interesting ways and then there's other parts of it where if you do something wrong our client basically says like you guys are working on a hundred shots ILM is working on a thousand shots. They haven't screwed this up once and you guys have screwed it up multiple times. Stop being immature, you know, rookie idiots and get it, get it straight. So we have to take that stuff super seriously and, and just hope that uh, the, the team can handle that stuff. And so it is, it is tricky because it, again, like our, our criteria then becomes not just like, people who are clever and creative, people who can combine that with, you know, a certain amount of like technical knowledge and be able to translate that into stuff that ties into the core ideas that make projects successful. And then on top of that, people have incredible quality control and like the ability to track all these different little uh, areas that need to be checked off and, and, and lined up just right. Otherwise, no matter how good the creative is, we, we still end up looking like dummies. I think that goes back into what Artem was saying is that like, I think not to the extent of like, I had never taken notes before when getting feedback to finally doing that. But like it does, I do like catch myself doing that more because there were so many, like, especially I wasn't working on like the more film side, but just more on the like automotive side for a long time. Like they have very specific things they need to hit just because like legal issues of like 
people, you know, are using this in like a vehicle or like a big machine that, you know, things need to be like sound and good and up to snuff like legally or else I can get in trouble. So just like paying attention to those like amount of details and like always doing like a QC on your end and like stuff slips through the crack, but like there's enough like barriers before it goes out the door that normally it's like good. But yeah, I think like taking notes when it's like, you know, maybe your art director on like other things where it's like, let you know, it's just like an ad for something. It's like, maybe you don't have to hit these things, but it's like, Hey, this is the third time I've asked you to like, make sure this is like this set font size because we legally need to do that. You're like, Oh yeah. Like it doesn't seem big, but like being able to like track all those notes and then implement them and turn them around. is like a, a something that like I learned like the, a lot more importance because before that my stuff was like, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a Duncan social post that like has like something like a little bit off. Cause it's, you know, not that high stakes, but it's like, you know, when it's a UI in a car that someone's going to, you know, need to have consistency on than it does um, different stuff like that. So I agree with that. Artem is that perception to teach a lot of like of those QC kind of, you know, just be better at managing yourself sort of things. Yeah. As Johnny mentioned, like we have to be serious about that job. And I guess Johnny uh, had a really bad time with me because I was kind of treating motion graphics like, Hey, let's do some fun shit. And I was curing this problem in me for a while, <clears throat> especially on Spider-Man, which was like really, uh, he gave like hard time for a lot of artists around the world. And I was just like, Oh, we're doing glowing shit. Let's like, let's render in the same folder <laughs> like two different paths and okay we lost a couple images and that was really bad oh uh, you also instilled um i don't know about you artem but like a, a version up like ptsd tick in myself where like i'll version up like three times in a row just to make sure that it's a version up and i don't overwrite something previously because there's just i've never been somewhere oh, where where it, like you just need like to just make sure that like even if it you know that like there's only one little change and you can re-save a version like never overwriting versions because they'll definitely come back like six months later and be like we actually like x y and z out of like v o o like four six five can you pull that up and like implement that into this one you're like oh no i saved over that just because i thought we were like kind of done with it and moved on so it's just like that paranoia is like stuck with me just due to like how much Johnny would just be like, make sure we version up before we do all these new note changes. And it's just somewhere that like, I don't know if that happened to you too, Artem. Uh, for the like first, before perception, yeah, definitely it happened. Like I had like PST final, final, final <laughs> 001 and yeah, it didn't work out. But I remember the night I had to stay because the, we, messed up the name of the a lot of uh, in the file convention and we need to rename them just like because it's going to be faster instead of re-rendering that in the proper mm. folder and i i learned that lesson for the, the rest of my life i guess well these are all i mean these are all easy things to do right like they're mm -hmm. all simple things and once you just have them as routine or habit it's muscle memory, but I think it's, you know, it's also really critical that like every artist, you know, if, if you're, if you're in this thing as a business and you're dedicated to giving your clients the stuff that they need, there's a certain point at which you need to be empathetic to their point of view and their perspective of this stuff. And to them, if they're like, you know what, I liked the version three versions ago more, but just change this you know, there should be no reason for them to think that like that was set on fire and thrown away and that it's not just like a file that mm -hmm. can't just be opened really quickly and made some, you know, some have some tweaks made to it in order to, to solve whatever problem they have. Um, it's all, you know, it's all part of the part of the puzzle. But like I think of it as just like it's it's kind of part of like project hygiene you know, like there's a certain degree to which mm -hmm. you just, you do that as a base level and then it makes everything work smoother. And then of course it makes it a million times easier to, you know, collaborate with, uh, you know, your coworkers and colleagues and, and whatnot as well. Cool. Do you have any other questions for everyone, Artem? I have a bunch of questions. Shoot. Uh, yeah. 
they kind of like my jokes you didn't like but that's why i got donates and you didn't uh okay uh gg vp burke guys tell me what to do i'm studying for interface design in germany at first it was interesting for me to integrate 3d elements into the interfaces but now i realized that this is my this is my because it's capital letters three modeling and anemia i guess animation question is it worth moving to another faculty communication design or, or product design thanks in advance did you uh, understand my so i think i i think i have a vague understanding it sounds like uh i thought the guy wants to switch faculties yeah. He's 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 studying interface design right now, but wants to get wants to integrate three D and is trying to figure out if he should move to you know another uh, you know another section of the of the school or or whatnot. Um, to me, he, he was integrating two D UI interfaces into three D, and he realized he likes three D more than two mm. D interfaces. He he wanted to mm -hmm. switch to three D faculty. Yeah, I mean, school, you're paying for school. So you got to like, sometimes you got to force school to, to give you what you want out of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, even when I when I was in school, motion design wasn't even a thing. It wasn't a concept. There was no 3D. There was no 2D. There was no like, there was no class where anybody said the word keyframes <laughs> to you. So uh when I was in school, you know, getting like a very traditional like graphic design degree, I found every different way that I could to say like, hey, for this project, I'm going to make, you know, an animation piece or I'm going to set up an independent study with one of my professors, you know, where I'm going to get deeper into animation or After Effects or, or whatever it was. And so I think, you know, if you have to, if you have to jump to uh, different, you know, a, a, a a, a different focus or different courses or work with different professors like absolutely do it if you can't do that you know find ways to work it into the work that you're doing like i'm i to me i'm super interested in that hybrid of kind of motion design and like interactive and you know i think there's a lot of interesting things there that are super applicable when it comes to like even if you were just studying like say web design there's still a lot that you could do with bringing 3d into that and mm -hmm. and building that into into your work and into your process but you know it's it's you're you're paying for it so you got to make it work for you not just fall in line with with whatever pathway they're trying to shove you down he said thank you i got a lot of motivation seiji just enjoyed our youtube i guess it's my stream on youtube hey seiji hey uh, you mentioned something and I wanted to ask some and I forgot. Okay. I'm yeah. curious what your um experience was like, Artem, like working on your feast like your first feature film. Cause I know that like it's pretty like it's like a tight ship to run because it's like obviously like you were saying, there's lots of other moving parts and you have to like kind of conform to the piece that you need to play in like the bigger picture and being able to, you know, get files from someone hand files out to another person and like, make sure it's all like a cohesive unit. How was that? Was it like pretty jarring to start? I, you know, cause like I came in and I worked, you know, more commercial side, which is less kind of like that and a lot more like kind of the traditional, I would say motion design pipeline, but yeah. you know, film obviously has a lot stricter rules and you're working with ILM and, you know other compositors and that sort of thing so i came from 3d mapping projects mm -hmm. which has like a lot of dealing with another departments when you need to hand uh, your project files but excitement of the working on the feature film was like for me it was kind of like a holiday every day i was happy to to just to touch that but when you do pretty picture of like glowing spidey costume on top of in after effects just in the uh add uh, how you call that add mode the the multiply Additive, mode yeah 
and then uh, producer says to you, you need to do like eight frames uh, handles on the sequence. Then you need to rename the like thousand files. Then you need to change the color space you worked in. And this not costume we got, we had like the latest version of it. We need to update that. And it just be became like, I spent two hours designing thing and I spent like four hours preparing things to, to give it to the editor in Marvel. And my, my mood became like, whoa to oh fuck and this is like the whole feature films i was like working on them in that kind of mode yeah and then i got to this uh, secret project when i met you i guess because i was most of the time i was in this room and we yeah. kind of we didn't speak to each other and emerge from the the dungeon and then I would, then you would just be like gone again. I was like, huh, I wonder what's going on in there. But interesting. Do you think that, what <laughs> was that just because it was your first feature film? Like, was it, it's definitely probably gotten easier now that you know, like, oh, this is the color space. Oh, this is like the naming conventions. I would assume that like on your next one or like the most recent, like you worked on the Falcon and Winter Soldier main on end. So I'm assuming that like by now it's maybe a little bit more streamlined and a little less of like four hours renaming stuff probably right or no uh, yeah it's uh i couldn't afford myself to do the same stupid mistakes <laughs> after like one project because like yeah yeah sorry johnny can you like don't do that because people assuming you're really bored <laughs> and he, they they said this guy wants to drink something you guys boring <laughs> <laughs> This is uh, this is like I'm I'm sitting here admiring, you know, everything that I'm soaking in from you, Artem. This is uh, like here. Is, is it better? Yeah, it's the double hands is much better. Yeah, yeah. my that's boy. intrigued. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Yeah, when it, like I was working alongside with Doug, and there is no room to make this kind of mistake because Doug is like kindest person I ever met in my life. And if Doug gets mad, you screwed up. Like even Doug, like, okay, in my notebook, there is no, no, this name for this title. Why did he do that? And he asks you like in a really like calm way. And I just like started to, to sweat again. So yeah, the after after second movie, it was much more easy to and straightforward to 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 keep files in the proper name. I'm pretty sure I witnessed a couple scenarios where you know Doug would catch some glitch or something that you made, and you would try and bullshit your way out of it, <laughs> and explain that like no, but it's not really a problem because of this, and it was just you just basically saying like no, water isn't wet. And the sky isn't blue. Um, when you're when you're working on these projects, it is like you know that stuff. It's it's those things are difficult. But like I don't know. I don't I don't think of any of them as being a pain or you know depressing to work with or whatnot. Because it's just kind of like when you when you want to play at that level, you have to you have to have your shit together. You know you've got to be on top of all of these things. And so for us, it's I think everyone. Um, probably, you know, when you're working on this stuff, there's high expectations that might bring, you know, personal anxieties with it or, or whatnot. And I think we all strive to outperform those little gotchas and those little, you know, glitches or, or little errors or whatnot that we might try and just kind of like, you know, sweep under the rug um you know as more junior artists or or whatnot but i think it's i think it's a critical thing that you know you stay you stay on top of that stuff and again that stuff is like it's hygiene like as long as you're used to it you're not like oh god every morning i have to climb into a shower and pour hot water onto myself and then rub abrasive soap on my body like once it's routine, like it's, it's, you don't, you don't think of anything of it and you start to like enjoy it or it starts to be like the, the lead up to the like, okay, I'm like getting, you know, I'm getting all my framework set up and now I can dive in and focus on the exciting problem solving, the fun parts of this 
and not have your time eaten up by all mm-hmm. that other stuff. And, and that's the thing, like for us as a studio, it is a very frustrating thing when we run into problems in that space. And when people don't like appreciate that those things are problems because they have to be dealt with. They're so mandatory. Like they are mandatory to the point of like, if you're not handling this stuff, the people at the studio, like the director of the film will see the shot and will be like, I love the creative that's in here. This is wonderful. But before it gets to the director, there's like such a, there's so many layers of other people that are going to look at it who are told like, I have no right to decide if I like this or don't like this. I'm just here to see if there's anything wrong (laughs) with it. If there's anything off, if there's one thing that's like a millimeter out of place, it's my job to be like, I'm here in this chain of command to call out that the black bars are like three pixels too tight at the top and bottom of the frame. Uh, And you better not fuck that up again, losers. So send it one more time and fix those black bars, you know, like, so if, if you can get around that stuff, uh, it, it makes the process uh, possible to, to enjoy again. Cool. Um, Artem, any other ones that you have coming through yours? Uh, I guess it comes to you about freelancing. Why are you freelancing, not stuffing? Me? Yeah. Johnny's um, in <laughs> his stuff. Yeah, Johnny's been stuffed for a bit. Johnny actually knows <laughs> this because obviously if you for, like permalant somewhere a while, they're going to come by and be like, what do you, you want to just do this for real? <laughs> like actually work with us like full time. Um, and I essentially, <laughs> I essentially just had to give like the same response that Johnny gave, I guess the first time that perception, like asked him if he wanted to go staff. It was just like, it's just like, I've only, I have an issue of permalancing places. Cause I get just comfortable with the teams and I'm just like, if we can keep booking, like I'll just keep, stay in here because it's fun so like previously before i was at perception i was at a place that i was like fairly familiar with imaginary forces and i was with them for about six months and then you know i was with perception for like a year and i was like i just need to like try to do more quick turnarounds and like get a feel for some more like studios out here so i've been trying to not you know just go back to studios i've already worked with work with new ones and so that's kind of been this year is like i went back to imaginary forces for a bit um and then i'm at the mill now and it's just it's it is interesting to see kind of which style or flavor is nice and there's like different things of each one and that's what i'm like excited about to learn like like we were saying like all these file structure things are like a little bit more on you in side of perception to like make sure that you're in the right thing but just like went to the mill and it's just so different because they're too big for that to be a thing that artists have to do. So like you quite literally can't mess it up because they have so many tools for you, like inside of cinema or after effects. Like I never save the way that we save normally. It's all these built in tools that like pretty much keep you confined to like working inside a folder structure that will like stand the test of time and never, ever, ever mess up. So it's, you know, kind of nice once you get used to it, but it also took me about like three days of reading like, pdfs to like figure out exactly how it's supposed to be saving stuff and all of that sort of thing so there's more on ramping and less like running and gunning but things like that that are interesting do you know that like you know maybe when you get at that like huge scale of a company because they're pretty massive like you know you have to work in a bit tighter you know much more a single role whereas like my last job i did with you guys at perception was like a thousand hats and just like kind of like everyone on the team was like let's see if if we can do it and pull it off, that'd be cool. Like, let's just put faith in the, a very small team to kind of like keep this thing and like push it across the finish line, which is fun and, you know, in its own right and kind of like feels, you know, a lot more like in the trenches together on stuff. So I, I like still finding that. And there's a bunch of places that kind of will reach out. And cause I'm permalance, I'll just be like, I'm actually booked for like a good four months. And they're like, okay, cool. We'll talk to you next year, I guess, and see if we can, bring you on so until i've kind of i guess until people stop asking i'll probably just keep freelancing and then if i find a place that you know after a couple years seems like i keep returning to or really like the people there then i'll look at staff but that's the reason that i'm freelance is just i need to date a lot of studios (laughs) 
to see who I want to sit down and marry for 25 years like Johnny. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it's, yeah. And I, I, I usually suggest to people when they're, when they're really young, like get out and freelance around quite a bit because you can find that range of, of experiences. Um, but also at the same time, if you can find a place where they are going to invest in you or, mm-hmm. or kind of level you up during, you know, during your time there, um, it's not, it's not a bad idea. The thing that you, the thing that you have to avoid at all costs is being somewhere where you go staff and they're just like, perfect. We found like a mid to junior level person who can handle all the crap work. And we're just going to keep piling that onto yeah. that person uh, in, in perpetuity. <laughs> and if they get really good at it, then that's great because that work gets done much better as opposed to, and if they get really good at it, then they're ready to move on to bigger challenges and other responsibilities and, and whatnot. I'm kind of curious about that. Um, Cause you, you didn't come on as like the role, like that you are now, you weren't brought on as you were kind of like put up to be that at the end of it, just like moving up the ranks, which I think is cool to like be brought on lower level and not like, have a creative director like hired from outside like they just definitely invested in you over those years to get you to like where you are now where it's like you're very familiar with the company very familiar with like the legacy and stuff so I'm curious if it might be good to kind of maybe share your experience from going kind of like designer where it's like you know you couldn't even conceptually wrap your head around like the all the tasks that are required by like a creative director or like how anyone even gets to that point but I mean, I mean, that's where kind of your career has gone. So like, what do you think is like advice or like things that um, you can talk to about kind of starting as a, you know, even like a senior designer and then converting over to eventually being like a creative director? So I think it depends on the environment that you're, that you're in, but I always like it when there's people that come aboard a project. And even if, you know, let's say it's a, a junior or mid-level person that we bring aboard and we're just like, hey, we need you to help out on this piece of the project. And then that person is in every conversation around the project, whether it's directly with them or or not with them, is still kind of like peeking over the fence and is just like, wait, what if we what if we tried this? Oh, hey, haven't you seen this thing? Oh, this project, this project could be taken to the next level if we try this or this or this, even though I don't even know how to do that. Like what if we could steer it this way or whatnot? And so that was kind of always my, uh, you know, my thing is very, very passionate or just like obnoxiously enthusiastic about the work that we're doing and just always trying to figure out like when a project comes in, even if it's like, hey, this is, you know, this is a thing that we need to get done quickly and efficiently for client X. I would be like, oh, if we did this, we could make it award winning and just keep <laughs> pushing at every opportunity um, that there was to, to level these projects up. And so, you know, that kind of drive leads me into being nosy or pushy in like every part of the project, in the process and, and ultimately the business as a whole. And I think that helped because I was able to, you know, make suggestions or even just take a lot of actions on my own that helped you know projects helped processes helped relationships helped logistics and and whatnot and that that was something that that certainly was uh, critical to me leveling up and at, at perception we don't have like really you know uh rigid walls between each role or position on the team it's kind of like mm-hmm. We collectively are like, all right, we've got 10 different projects going on right now. So on, you know, this project, we've got these people. How is everybody going to be able to just bounce off of each other and work with each other to take the project as far as we can? And that is helped tremendously when people, you know, see kind of that window or that opportunity to take a little extra responsibility and grab a hold of it and and push themselves further with the process. So uh, you know, the, and that's kind of created another uh, sort of cultural thing at Perception, which is uh, almost uh, almost exclusively when someone is promoted to a you know to a higher level, it's because they've 
already been doing the the job mm -hmm. that they've been promoted to or they're already exhibiting you know those responsibilities and that level of expertise yeah and i think that's very cool i've been at definitely other places that that's not the case and you kind of like come into work today as a senior designer and you're like hey here's your new art director who is not familiar with any of this and um yeah just listen to them and their vision you're like oh i'd much rather be like my colleague who got promoted and like i already know how to work with and like has already like shown that i like can trust with all these things do you remember at all what your first thing you like directed was and if you were like absolutely terrified of the process or were you so comfortable at that time that you're just like oh yeah this seems natural oh no i think i mean every every time that i've like taken on a bigger bite than i had than i had previously it was always you know uh something that generated a lot of anxiety or, or <laughs> stress or, or whatnot going into it um and i i tend to bring up quite a bit um with senior level designers and art directors and whatnot that transitioning from being a creative on the box to being someone who's giving direction is a really difficult transition to make and mm. uh when i when i bring this up uh I, I do tend to get people that respond to me and, and tell me that they went through a similar experience but effectively when you're on the box and you're making stuff it gets back into what I was talking about earlier, where you, you have, you can very much see your tangible value right in front mm -hmm. of you. It's also very satisfying. Like, I think we all get a huge amount of satisfaction from doing this work. I think it's why so many people are really driven in this field and, and spend a lot of their personal time reinvesting into their abilities and their skill, because it's, it's something that is like, it's pleasurable to us to, mm -hmm have an idea in our mind and be able to execute it and be able to execute it in a way that you're happy with or even exceeds your your expectations when you start moving into directing it's ex it is not satisfying at all mm -hmm. that sort of like you don't you don't necessarily feel that sense of ownership that you felt and like you know when you're a high level senior designer and a project comes out that you you worked on um you look at that project and you're just like, I owned all of those shots or like, the, you know, these pieces of this thing wouldn't mm. have been possible at all without my contribution. I took it from a, a new comp, you know, window in After Effects or in, <laughs> in C4D or whatever to the thing that is now uh, playing on your television screen. And uh, when you're when you're just kind of like, nudging people along and saying like a little more like this and a little less like that and try to do this and and whatnot um you can look at it and and you know the initial feeling is like oh that that project came out beautifully and and really at the end of the day it was all it was all artem it was all artem <laughs> you know making making the stuff happen it was all uh isaac's beautiful renders that that made that happen and it took me a while before i was comfortable with the idea of owning like well actually like some of the nudging and some of the guidance and some of the direction that I'm, I'm providing is helping them get to you know the the end point and and whatnot and even still today I'm, I'm pretty confident that like eh, if I just went on vacation for the entire duration of the project I would come back and everyone would make something that's really awesome and, and really beautiful and cool um but uh but it does it does take a bit to appreciate that, you know, that sort of, uh, you know, guidance, uh, the strategy and the insight um, helps these things, you know, in a, in a way that you can feel is, is somewhat tangible. Yeah, uh, I can definitely kind of see how that, yeah, because it's always hard that, you know, when you like look at a creative director, it's like a little bit hard to tell how they came to that role. And like, you know, a lot of times you'll be like, I'll, try to really quickly like rough this out in c4d for you and like get some like mvp out that like i can show this idea so you can like tell that like obviously you're not like you don't need to be like a master at every piece of it but like you definitely root it you are rooted in like thinking of it the way that like the artist would versus some other people that kind of come from it and like have no idea what like the artist 
is or the, like the software the artists use but they just have like the vision to like help like they can direct based on what they see but not really like on how it was made and i feel like that's like a very different kind of creative director that i've experienced at a couple of places and it's just like it's always a little bit more uh fun to have someone that's like you know started somewhere similar to you and can kind of talk the language to you in a way where it's like you know they they're not like i don't know move the line it's like actually the spline needs to be like a little bit thinner when we do x y and z it's like okay yeah like you speak in my language that makes sense um but yeah that's i've always wondered about that we have a question in the chat says how has the remote landscape changed things for the better or worse um yeah uh that's a it was a big thing because i had started and i'd done about two months two and a half in studio and that's you know infinitely easier because you have the server everyone can open everyone's files everything's linked up um the security is not an issue because it's all based on like a pretty like lockdown area and then we moved to um remote and i think that was like you know perception worked with a couple people remote like a few artists here and there but never to the scale that we were going to do now but yeah for me it was or it still is sort of it got messy because you're you're running and gunning but also trying to like find the new folder structure and the new way of working and like everyone kind of changed like on the fly as we found better ways of doing it but um it definitely was like you know we had to keep keep running but also try to like build the track at the same time but yeah i'm curious on your side artem or johnny like how how was that kind of jumping from being totally in studio to totally remote <laughs> artem has a yeah has this a, is artem <laughs> Raise your hand yeah. in the chat. Uh, this actually was one of my questions because in Russia, freelance completely different. And I wanted to ask it in the first place. So in uh, when I came to America, for me, it was surprised freelance artists, they actually coming in at studio. Mm. Uh, because when in Russia, all freelancers, they just work from home. And I came from freelancing in Russia. So for me, it was a surprise to work from home. And yeah, being in pandemic, we're totally fine for me. It was stressful being in America for me <laughs> and, and switch from perception studio when I was in a comfort and everybody was looking after me. But when I go to like find myself in freelance field, that was really stressful, like three months. I had to like open my bank account. I need to figure out all the taxes stuff. I need to approach all the studios and present myself uh, like in a good way. Like, and I was presenting in this kind of English language you're hearing right now. And <laughs> you, you used to hear it, but the other studios, they were kind of everybody smiling in American saying like, you're good, but I see it. They bullshitting me. So uh, and I told Johnny, I had like uh, three months of English lessons with uh, uh, South, South African guy. And Johnny was laughing at me because I, I wanted to improve my accent here. Uh -huh. And yeah, but. I mean, uh, all in all, you have a very easy to understand, yeah, I, like much better than my Russian uh, is always my comparison. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's funny because, uh, you know, we're, we're back to talking about Vlad again, but, uh, <laughs> Vlad's, uh, English is, I think, uh, dramatically surpasses yours, but your delivery. Yeah. Yes. Delivery, because I don't know surpasses word. What is that? Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so, but your delivery of the language is, is excellent. And it's very, and it, and it's always felt very comfortable and you always are making terrible jokes, which makes you sound more, <laughs> you know, American and, and, and whatnot as well. But no, I always, I always found your, your delivery of the English language to be exceptional. Um, and it was, and it took a long time before I even like understood how little you you understand uh in in many different ways um but we we were always we were always very impressed with you artem and like you know uh and i think a big part of that is just like it's not your technical understanding of the language but i think a lot of it is just your personality shining through in your in your communication 
um, in a, in a wonderful way. Um, Thank you, sir. <laughs> uh, so uh, Jeff's question, how has the remote landscape changed things for better or worse? Um, in, in my opinion, I'm a big advocate for remote. Um, and when we went remote, it was pretty easy for me because I've always had like two or five people on the team that were not within the walls of the office while everybody else is. And uh, that, that, you know, it, it's challenging if you're not used to it, but having a bit of experience with it made it a good bit easier for, for me to transition to it. We have a whole bunch of other issues and challenges of perception with like confidentiality and secrecy around projects and all sorts of things that we had to institute, you know, both in terms of technology and procedures and whatnot, in order to make sure that we're abiding by practices and, and requirements that some of our clients have and whatnot. Um, but I, I still think it's a, a nice way of working. I do miss being able to just kind of like walk through the room and see something out of the corner of my eye on someone's computer that is usually either making me say like, holy shit, that's awesome. Or like, holy shit, don't do that, you know, and, and, and whatnot. But um, I'm also, I'm also busier than ever. And so remote has helped me kind of like make sure that in my day, I'm like keeping track with like every single different piece of the puzzle that's, that's going on as opposed to in the, in the physical office, it might just sort of be like, if I'm having a really busy day, it might just be the luck of the draw if I even get to connect with someone on what it is that they're they're working on or, mm -hmm. or what they're up to. Um, but also for me, because the work in this industry can be demanding and can be challenging, and especially you know when you're doing intense deadlines or especially on like film work or whatnot, if you have really intense deadlines and, and things around that, uh, to me, it's it's miles miles better to be doing that from home. And I mean, I uh, I I tucked my kids in to bed and read them a story for the like three hundred and seventy fifth consecutive night last night. And I never would have thought that that was possible in this industry because I've become so trained by and just adapted to the notion of like, well, when you have to, you, you know, you gotta, you gotta throw down extra hard. And there's times when you're at the studio until 10 PM or midnight, um, making, making shit happen. Um, because you're, you're in a tight spot and you're, you know, you're super dedicated to getting the project done for the client. And now I'm like thinking like, God, I spent like 15 years of my life uh, doing that when I could have just been uh, sitting at home, uh, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, oh, I gotta, I gotta check in on some stuff or, oh, I've got a, I've got a three hour render that I'm waiting for. So I guess I'm not going home until this time instead of just being like, no, I'm at home. I actually watch a movie while that render happens mm -hmm. or, or whatnot. Um, to me, there's, there's sort of no comparison and I'm expecting uh, you know, that we'll, we'll see a pretty big, we'll continue to see a pretty big shift in the way that we work and the way that we live for the next decade or so before we settle into what like new normal will be. Right. I think that, yeah, I missed the, the the culture of it and being able to like physically be in a space with new artists that would like come in as freelance or I would come into a new studio. It's like, you know, a lot easier to connect with people that way. Cause you're probably like desk mates with somebody and you're going to, you know, like I was with Seiji, um, when I was at like my first desk spot and it's just, you know, by happenstance of in proximity, you know, eventually you guys are all getting coffee together. And then like all of a sudden you're like kind of in the crew and then, you know, sharing ideas seems much more natural so you kind of bounce things off each other whereas like it feels a little like oh i don't want to bother them with like a slack dm about this issue i'm having so i'll just struggle on my own and try to figure it out where it's like in the office you're just like why why is this why and they're like oh okay yeah i'll help you out or someone behind you will have an idea it's just that sort of stuff i do miss but yeah 
because of the nature of our industry, like the last thing that we were on together was just like, would have been about four times as brutal if we had to do it in office. But like, you know, when the late nights came, it's like, cool. Yeah. I get to have my dinner for like an hour, like go back to work. Then like, you know, you know, wife and dog go to bed, like talk them in bed, like good night. And then, you know, go back for the next like four hours and like hammer it out. And, but like, if that entire time I was like at the studio, like it just would have been like demoralizing to keep doing that versus, you know, at home, you can kind of like be like, eh, what? I mean, the trade off's not that bad because I get to, you know, when I want to take a 15 minute break and like be at home where it's like, you can't instantly pop home when you're at the studio. So yeah, I would definitely say that most places I've worked at, it's like the, the, the pain of not being in office does not outweigh the joy of being at home. Yeah. And I'm trying to figure out, and I'm, I'm open to, you know, any, any ideas or suggestions, but I'm always trying to just figure out like, how do we bring a little more of that, like casual component into mm -hmm. the work from home. And, and cause that's the thing that I, that I do definitely miss most in the studio is just like, you know, somebody just like leaning back in their chair and shouting at the ceiling, a question for anyone else in the room to answer. And you know, I want to make sure that we're finding ways to do that on Slack or, or wherever we are mm -hmm. um, and it not having to feel like this formal thing of like, you know, hey, anyone ever, anyone ever heard of this thing or whatnot? Because that's, that's definitely the thing I'm missing most is just like some of the, the, well, both like just literally like water cooler banter, but also the pieces of that that end up being super relevant to the work that we do and, and uh, end up spiraling into things that end up having a big impact on a project. I'm missing the happy birthday songs in the office. Extremely awkward situations for me. The, what was it, Whenever. donuts? Yeah, donuts would come in and then we'd ever like mouth. I mean, like, I would say like... that that's the one thing that we have perfectly matched the awkwardness of over on Zoom the... calls. Uh, yeah, we it's, done, it's yeah. the Zoom calls. Oof. Yeah, I don't know if Isaac, I don't know if you've joined them. Artema, I can't believe you don't remember this, but we've done numerous Zoom birthday calls and trying to sing happy birthday over Doesn't Zoom work. and Sanu busts out his guitar and mm -hmm. whatnot. It's a it's a train wreck of catastrophic proportions. Okay. I guess I, I I managed to carve up it from my mind. <laughs> I think I and missed it, and yours, and Johnny. And then I and then I and like tried to get you to have one and you're like uh it was like two days ago i was like oh no <laughs> i'd actually missed that invite but i've been on a couple of them where yeah it's just it's just that 0.5 second delay where it's just it's just a yeah. cacophony of like different timings and notes at the same time i guess i uh, have to interrupt you uh, in my twitch account in chat there was like really active guy and he's really funny <laughs> And he's Moran as well in the same time. So the first comment from him, uh, I hate uh, expensive microphones for streams because you can hear every like uh, sound like. I'm so I, sorry. And then he said, I, I love this dude in. Uh, yeah, jo Johnny, <laughs> he loves you because like, he just firing up from the notebook, but uh he, he uses this like funny curse russian word which became more like funnier sorry uh <laughs> questions i'm not going to make any what was jokes that? hold anymore. on hold on what, what was that you gotta explain to me what you were just describing to me uh the funny uh russian curse word i don't know like uh fucking shooting probably you're gonna say like this guy just fucking shooting from his notebook microphone something like that he's saying that like your sound is really crap oh <laughs> yes there. see yes. see isaac no it works so perfect uh okay he's saying no my translation is okay also he asked like uh does anybody go to the gym because you guys look fucked up three of us uh okay uh also does are we Johnny... getting cyber bullied by russians from your stream is that i guess he Artem? i guess he's just uh messaging from like prison or something because 
I don't know. He's nice. really rude. Uh, uh, does Johnny plays any games? Plays games with my emotions. <laughs> Every... <laughs> That's uh, that's it. Um, no, I I wish I I wish I had time to play games. I I used to play uh, games, particularly racing simulators, uh, back in the day. But I don't have I don't oh, have you, the time for it uh, nowadays. You really big uh, like Formula One guy? Something. I was wondering about this uh, barber. Uh, Russian barber next to our office. He's the racing guy as well. Uh -huh. But everybody gone from Manhattan. Like, and how he can survive? Uh, I, I forgot his name. Yeah, Arthur. I meant to actually go visit him uh, the other day. I was in the city because I went to uh, check in at the office. It was my first time going into the city in a very long time. Um, and I completely forgot to pop in and see him, but I saw the barber pole was spinning. So I assume he's, uh, he's in business. I assumed he was not just actually doing only barber shop because when I had some, like, uh, I've Art been there. Oh. <laughs> please, please. Not here. Okay. Not here. But am, am I right? Because it, that was huge back. And I don't think that was just like oh. for haircuts. Okay, uh, let's move on. Uh... Okay, I have a question <laughs> that I ask everyone. Do you have a hot take right now on any topic, Johnny or Artem, that you want to share? Design industry or not, just any any hot take opinion that's been eating away at you. I, I assume you've had many other discussions about NFTs. Uh, oh, yeah, I, I, got a, yeah. I got a lot of questions about NFTs now. <laughs> Um, do, I, do I, I'm intentionally trying to keep my takes lukewarm on NFTs and not, you know, not go off the deep end. So I don't want to, I don't want to get too into it. I think it's a wonderful and fascinating thing. I hate what it's done to my Twitter timeline. Like I, like <laughs> I, like my Twitter timeline is now the cringiest shithole in the world. Um, and I have a very high tolerance as you can tell for, cringy awkwardness um and it's uh it's like intolerable at this uh at this point Ooh. but beyond that i think it's super fascinating i'm i'm curious about it and like you know i'm, I'm constantly in my mind being like maybe you know as as everybody is being like, maybe i should see if i could make you know many thousands of dollars doing this um but for for me it's uh it's not uh, I'm, I haven't yeah. jumped to that side yet. I would much have rather it messed up my Instagram than my Twitter um, because it was kind of nice and quiet. Like there was a very specific Twitter motion design industry that I was in and like I liked it and like anything that was on my feed was normally like something I was like genuinely interested in. And then yet yeah, late 2020 just... I started noticing lots of people joining. I was like, this is awesome. I wonder why this is. And then all that like stuff sort of rise to the top. And I've definitely been a part of it. And it's hard because like it's it's quite literally the only space that uses it or has to seems to have any like traction when like posted about. So it's like I just wish that there was another another avenue that that could trickle down and be just as successful. But give me my old Twitter timeline back. Have you yeah. sold your cars picture? No, I have not I'm sold my cars good. picture. I put it for very expensive, so I don't expect it to sell for a good bit of time. But um, I sold one. Artem, what's, what's, what's your NFT situation? Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I think you as being someone that's on the bleeding edge of, uh, of these things. Where uh, I do the same as you did. I just intentionally tried to like avoid all the news about that. I was really excited as well on the, when it just started. And the same stuff with my Twitter timeline, with the Instagram, just, hey, here's my first drop. But the one thing I want to say, it's really great thing for Russian artists because like, mm. even if you sell your picture for one Ethereum, you can live like a king for a year in my hometown. 
and this is really great for them like to to avoid russian clients because mostly it's like either government or like we don't have like huge companies who can spend a lot of money on commercials as you guys Mm -hmm. in the u.s have like here is like coca-cola apple google all the automotive companies here but yeah in russia you not paying well being as motion graphic designer and this is like really huge hope for the young artists especially to to start but yeah the the at the same energy. time like that huge that huge hope has got to be like you know is the space hyper crowded now is it like oversaturated and a lot of yeah. people are deeply deeply disappointed yeah i mean i would definitely say that i'm not like i'm a a pessimist in a lot of things and i just like would love to see the correction because i feel like it is obviously everyone's very excited and kind of overhyped it to an extent where i think it's not as sustainable so i'm, I'm interested to see what the correction over the next like year or two is down to like what it may probably stay at um amazing if it keeps you know being huge a lot of friends that like personally who i've known who have like quite literally had their lives changed to like they only take freelance bookings they really love and they get to kind of just pay themselves out of their like earnings which is super cool but at the same time there's lots of lots of stuff that totally boggles my mind how anyone is excited about it and how it sells and so i think it's just such a weird space and especially bringing all the money talk to the space which like you know motion designers were very chill about sharing rates before kind of and that was a big push in the industry like everyone should be more educated and get paid more but like that is a little bit different than like watching a lot of your peers like make a yearly salary in a week and being like oh okay um you know that's weird because like we've worked on similar jobs so like should i try to make like my yearly salary in a a week and like really go for it or what is like the space and it's just it's a little bit more like uh you know front facing in that regard so it's definitely an interesting space i think that there are good and bad things about it but i don't think that it's enough to like have someone totally swear off or totally have allegiance to them either way i think a middle ground is a yeah safe I mean, space. Even, even if it's a even if it's a, a gold rush towards a bubble that's going to pop any second now i still think like well yeah get in get in on that get it get it while it's uh Right. While it's good, uh, uh, be a lot better than looking back on it and being like, man, remember that, you know, six months or 18 months or five years where this thing was crazy? You know, I wish I had at least taken a shot at that. Um, yeah. I'm curious about like trying to figure out like what's the, you know, if I was to get into that space, I would want to try and just figure out what's like a strategy for success there and how do you how do you make that happen and you know uh, it's it's i would put all my mental energy into trying to figure out like what's the perfect nft to generate when in reality probably the right strategy is just to like go in there and everything you know yeah not just something but just make everything and then figure out which of those like you know things hits right and then then everyone seems to be an uh, expert and even though the space is so new everyone like has their own idea of exactly what will work and what has worked and it's like oh kind of just it's still like a superstition at this point because like there's just not enough data or like on like stuff to look back on and like definitively say something because every week like you know what was a perfectly sound stat two weeks ago has totally been up done upended now with like new data based on what is successful so it's like you know i think that um my kind of reasoning for getting into it was like um i kind of just said that because a lot of these are invite only or you have to get accepted to you know list on their site and do it so i was like if it if i'll apply and if i don't hear back i don't hear back and then if i don't get invited by a friend i don't get invited by a friend and i'll just like put that you know worry on you know just eventually it will happen and when it does maybe i'll get into it and if it doesn't i won't be upset so that's kind of where i was in september of last year didn't hear anything all of that year from any of the places so i was like okay i guess that's like not for me right now and then just you know a week ago a friend uh invited me to one so i was like i guess this is it so better get my stuff in gear to like try to list it so i did 
and I've been talking with a lot of other artists like um you guys probably know like Cornelius Damrich is like a big you know artist in the space who's done very well and been talking with him and kind of getting his ideas on it and for him it took like a good three months before he even like got up and running to like where he had a pretty insane week or two where like he kind of like it all dropped um and like started going in motion so i think it's you know hard to you know have watch a space that you are pretty sure will go away but also be patient in the space and just kind of like know that a lot of it's outside of your hands because it's not like it's art directors or like people kind of collecting stuff and it's like oh what worked in motion design is like a tr- uh, something that was good will work in this space is something that was good it's like a lot of it's just like people who happen to have like cryptocurrency and like want to invest it in a different way so it's it's a very weird space very brand new and if anyone's like claiming to be an expert i would take it with a huge huge lump of salt I want to find the shitty thing that people will flock to and and want to purchase. Like I want to make the NFT equivalent of the wooden signs that you, you hang up in your kitchen that say live, love, laugh, or or something mm-hmm. like that. And uh, figure out what's the what's the NFT easy to produce, almost generative, just <laughs> churn them that's out. That's my that's that's my recipe for success is make something as a, as a joke and then see it, you know, see it be more successful than anything that I've ever legitimately <laughs> cared about. Yeah. The guy sold, you know, the Murat Pak, probably Isaac, he sold the red pixel, just mm-hmm. one yeah. square pixel. That was, that's kind of art is great, but uh, transition to freelance for me became like the cure of not like lost my sane watching other people making money on nfts because like i spent a lot of uh nerves to being like proper freelance artist in america and see like i'm not a huge artist on instagram who making like a lot of money just because they had audience before they started beating nfts Hmm. but people who had like the same uh, followers as i have they don't make like such a huge amount of money but they still spend a lot of time so they beating their nfts and they try to find collector in twitter and message him to buy and i Mm -hmm. don't think this is cool way to to spend your time no instead of just being on the proper project Yeah, I think that it's it's weird because it's 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 kind of hard to see the gold rush and not like want to get your piece of it. And I feel like it's just kind of made a lot of people like kind of just throw social norms out the door. Um, whereas like it would be very uncouth to do those sorts of like, hey, please buy this from me kind of th- messages to people in like normal life but like for some reason the space has like allowed it because it's worked for a couple of people so other people are like i don't know maybe i'll do that too but yeah it's uh it's a little weird to see and that's what i don't like about my my twitter feed and so i'll mute i've muted a lot of people just so that like i can try to clear it out or i made also a list of like stuff to try to bring back my old timeline but i think it's just for the time being we're just gonna have to let it sit there for a bit and eventually it will it will calm down and stuff but who knows? Hard to make a prediction. Do you know people at Perception who did uh, many NFTs? I don't know. Johnny? Uh, there's, uh, there's, you remember uh, Alex? Alex Manrica. Yeah, he's done a ton. He's, uh, he's, he's been very successful in the space. I should note he's also no longer working at Perception. Oh. Might, might be a coincidence. Uh, um, uh, but uh but yeah he's he's been doing some cool stuff and i think he kind of stumbled into the space if i if i understood correctly um and and was in it very very early Mm -hmm. on so i think that's uh i'm I'm super super excited to hear about just you know the success that he's had in there and uh just even how you know for him it wasn't like you know some insane explosive success but it's been something that's proving to be at least at the moment somewhat evergreen for him right that yeah i think awesome. that um he was telling me about it like and this he was before the big beeple drop that happened that kind of oh. brought a ton of eyes to it so he was like there for like 
couple months before that. So like very, very um, new into the space and kind of, I was like talking to him a bit on our Slack about it. And I was just like, eh, you don't, I don't quite understand it. And then obviously everything happened and lots of eyeballs came to it. And I was like, Hey, what was that thing you're explaining to me? And where should I sign up to do those things? Cause it looks like a good space. And he was, yeah, he's done a lot. But he got to micro micros place, which is mm -hmm. great to be. Mm -hmm. it's yeah, almost he was there early. It's almost impossible to get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do you have any other questions coming through? I I realized that I pulled up your chat just to realize it's entirely in Russian, and I don't know why I pulled it up because I can't read any of this. You don't want to read any of it. There's lots of terrible, horrible, horrible things. Yeah, we discussing that, like uh, discussing, it. like you guys don't like this silly jokes. I know Johnny does, and he's just bullshitting us on the internet now. But he really likes stupid, silly jokes. I had the pleasure to to do them in your office, just without any internet connection. Oh, it sounds really bad, but what what did you do in my office without internet connection what do you oh you mean you mean you you were able to verbally deliver jokes to me in person right yes uh did you find the rest of the stickers oh no you we, we left the office at the same time i guess yeah you know what uh i did a thorough you know hunt through all my stuff and i don't think i found any more uh stickers so uh artem and i have a game that we play with each other and it's that we uh we share a a friendly gesture with with one another uh and try to surprise each other with it whenever uh whenever we can um which is uh which is which is just lovely uh it's it's been, it's been one of my favorite things extremely professional together yeah yeah it helps to you know keep everything nice and uh and and sophisticated for us when we're uh when we're working together um uh oh did i lose oh. you guys you went no, to the picture can, can see. did my feed drop oh, i think i'm having i think i'm having some bandwidth issues now it's red is that better it's red. Why is it red? Oh, it's red uh, because oh, Artem, right there. That was somehow really you fun. guys switched spots on my stream, like because yeah. you left and you came back, and now your two your titles are switched. I don't know how. I'm gonna oh, perfect. <laughs> so you're Artem. So if you hey, one. hey, look at me. I'm Artem. I'm a I'm a very funny guy. <laughs> hey, look at me. I'm Johnny. I'm every. Every, every everybody want to know my bank account? Let me uh, here. Let me write it down and put it up on the uh, on the screen for you. A new one. I'm I'm totally safe right now for a while until anybody asks me again about that. Um. So uh, we we're wrapping up, I guess, right? Yeah. Um. One of the last questions that I normally ask people are, "What is your?" Everest project, which I don't know if that will make sense to you, Arnon, but what is your like big dream project to work on? Johnny wants to direct the Fast and Furious movie. Really? Yes, yeah. I want to. I want to, I want to direct a, a Fast and Furious movie. Uh, I've I've been really fortunate in that, like, I've had an opportunity to have some of these kind of like, wow, that's something I've always wanted to do. Kind of projects, mm -hmm. and you know, one of them was. Uh, the work that we had done for Black Panther, which, you know, for me was both like creating a cool technology paradigm that, you know, felt really distinct and different from whatever else we've seen. And also making like a title sequence that was doing what, you know, to me, the the holy grail of like title sequence is for us as designers is like something that's like beautiful and interesting and clever, but also pushes some, you know, technical boundaries for us. Mm -hmm personally and whatnot so we we had that um you guys know i'm i'm a big car geek and i love all the automotive stuff many mm -hmm. years back we got to work on designing the instrument cluster for the ford gt which was just like that was for me total like dream as a kid and got to 
go to Ford and go into this like secret underground studio that like the people that were working above it didn't even know was there and see this vehicle mm. that wasn't going to come out for two more years and, and get involved in something that was like super, super exciting along those lines. So, you know, for, for me, uh, there's part of me that's like, Oh shit. Does that mean like, it's all downhill from here and there's nothing else, you know, fun left to do. Um, I'm still interested in trying to get into something that is in the uh, kind of like the Imagineer space. Uh, if you think of like the, the Disney mm-hmm. Imagineers and, and creating these really ambitious and really wild physical experiences. Um, I think there's some, some pretty neat stuff there that I would like to get into. And otherwise I'm just interested in continuing to kind of like bounce back and forth between the, you know, the future of technology in, in film, and then also the future of technology for, you know, for real human beings. That's cool. Artem, what about you? I think it's directing something as well, just, but in motion graphic field, it would be like a title sequence, but not just an artist, but put some ideas I, I just finished the book uh 1984 mm. and I, I made a lot of sketches on the like imagine it's a tv show or something maybe sometime i will do like in my personal project but you know how it works for motion graphers <laughs> everybody has their personal yep. projects and now they are nfts oh <laughs> uh, yeah johnny like uh far ahead of me on like uh, completing his uh, dreams i still like have a lot of them so yeah <laughs> well, what about you yeah Ooh. isaac what's uh i don't know i think it's sort of the cliche one of just like a main title of an ip that I, like i really care about would probably be like up there like in my head i know that there's it's not on the books yet but i would love to do like the next Tron main titles or something or something like that. Just like an IP that I think is like, you know, or like star Wars or like any of those. It's just like kind of just to get it on, on, on like your, like a portfolio and just like kind of go through the experience of that sort of thing. And then after that, I don't know. Yeah. Probably like directing something that's like my own idea from like my own IP or being able to jump on like, you know, franchise or something but i don't know i think that those are always just so cool to be working with like these long standing legacies of stuff with so much like rich history and getting to like be this like responsible of that i think is always a fun cool thing um but yeah it's pretty cliche at this point to say i want to do a main title or like a main on end but they're just they're still so cool um you guys got to do that uh pretty recently um was that fun? I like, I think that like WandaVision at least was like crazy because I wasn't expecting that. But then like the Falcon and the Winter Soldier stuff was crazy because I helped pitch on that. And then to see like exactly how it ended up was like so crazy because I literally saw like the one week rush to do it of like all the ideas and then like nothing. And then the final one was like, oh, wow, that's like, I can see like where there were like the bits and pieces of stuff that like, even on our calls, Johnny, where you're like, I don't know, something like this one idea that was like one sentence ended up really informing other stuff down the, um, down the line. So I think that that was really cool. Um, and Artem, you got to work on those too. How did, how did they, how did like kind of all that stuff? Yes, I was just helping here and there on this Winter Soldier. I did all this. I don't know, Johnny did they change the like like between the scenes when like it's location pins or something i did yeah the the locators locators yeah i did only that one so Um, it was much more fun on uh, black can i say that johnny the 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 asian girl with the red head uh technically no but <laughs> yeah there's uh so yeah so you i work on i work on that and that was more fun because like i was in charge of yeah you you made some really rad stuff for that other thing 
Um, so there's, yeah, there's WandaVision, there's Falcon and the Winter Soldier. And then there's going to be, there will be more stuff in the, you know, in throughout May, the, the rest right, of the year. Right. That's when they, uh, I don't, I don't know anymore. <laughs> I think everything, everything keeps changing and whatnot. Uh, it's been interesting yet. Yeah, Cause there's been, you know, there's been some films that we've worked on mm-hmm. and then there's been some TV shows that we've worked, that we've worked on after working on the films. And of course the TV shows have all come out and the films are all perpetually getting delayed and later yeah. and later. Uh, was it cool to um, see kind of like, um, cause WandaVision was like a weekly thing that came out. Do you think that like, um, it was it was more interesting to see that like people were connecting with it more because like they were watching it like kind of week to week and like trying to hide or like see all the connections that you guys had sprinkled throughout there um, or was yeah that, like... that, that was that was super fun for us because we're used to just making them at the end of these films and mm-hmm. when it's at the end of the film everyone's you know finished with the experience yeah. and whatnot the fact that they're releasing these a week at a time there's like this week-long period at least for the you know for the die hard super fans which we're very fortunate that Mm -hmm. you know these properties have a really rabid fan base during that period of time between episodes everybody's speculating and talking about it and and whatnot and so with wandavision there was there was that there was also with wandavision it had been you know something like 18 months or whatnot since a Marvel property had been mm-hmm. released just because of the pandemic. So I think there was also a lot of like pent up demand and it was just exciting to see everybody thrilled about that. And then on top of that with WandaVision, like the show is so committed to this motif of being this retro, uh, this very authentic retro sitcom that the title sequence at the end of the episode was one of the only pieces of the episode that felt like traditional MCU. So right. I felt like, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm always very proud of the work that we do on these things. And I think our team does an unbelievable job on them, but I also never discount the fact that like we get a lot of extra love just because it's associated with these, you know, enormous mm-hmm beloved properties and and so it's it's always fun to see that response uh with falcon and the winter soldier that piece turned into sort of like easter egg central um and i can't go you know super in depth with it but there's a lot of really fun little nuggets that we tucked into that thing and i think you know probably four hours after it premiered at midnight or whatnot like every single one of those things was listed somewhere on the internet and flagged and people were, you know, creating theories and, and mm-hmm. whatnot based off of that stuff. So it's been, it's been fun for us. And it's also been kind of like an education in, in now we approach these things very much with this mindset of like, how do you design a title sequence so that over the course of the season, it means something different mm-hmm. to you every time that you rewatch it, you know, hoping that people are actually watching it and not just, you know, skipping ahead to the next episode or whatnot, but that week by week, you're all of a sudden like, oh, now this shot actually, you know, makes a little more sense to me and has kind of unraveled some of the story some more. Uh, and of course, at the same time, without it spoiling anything. Yeah, I think that Disney also found their stride in like um, knowing that about their fan base and kind of sticking that extra scenes after the credits so that like it wasn't yeah. like, yeah, the experience is over and like I'll just flip it off. Like there were things inside the credits that like helped inform things that were in the secret scenes after the credits. So like it just made sense to watch all of it. And then, like, even though you'd seen it once, you had new context every episode. So watching it again, you're like, oh, okay. I thought that was just, like, a fun transition. But I see when the whole thing, like, does this movement, it's like, oh, it's because it's referencing something we just saw. And so, like, watching, I watched it, like, every single time, mainly because, you know, didn't want to skip past it because I, you know, like the work and I try not to do that. But the other thing was that, like, there was new things to find. Plus, there was a, I knew there was a scene after it most of the time. So, I think that they did a really good job with that. Um, a lot of places don't really think that like thoroughly through like making people watch like stuff or like, you know, the skip button has been a big, you know, hot topic in our industry where Netflix like encourages viewers to kind of just jump past a ton of work that people did. 
Um, mm. But I think that, yeah, the main on end for those were like just super cool to see. Um, but yeah, I think that we can we can wrap it up here. We've been almost going for two hours almost, which is kind of crazy. Great. Um, yeah, anything else that you wanted to add, Artem, before we... The quick up. story about one division, and yeah. I, I want to ask Johnny to tell this story. Do you know this story about the? I was in a team with Doug and pitching titles for so they have like different titles for each time time zone, or how it's not time zone, right? It's time area, mm -hmm. whatever. Time area. You don't know this story, so okay, uh, it's about my English again. Uh, I did like 27 versions of the titles saying one division because I, I was tasked by the phone so Doug just called me and I, I didn't know the name of the project it was secret name and I didn't know the actual name one division and he told me we need to do like one division titles and I did one division like 27 versions of this title <laughs> <laughs> and I spent like five hours something and he just responded to me, thank you, Argo. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh. But then he sent me the Twitter of some American guy, like native English speaker. And he said like, doesn't it sound like one division? And I said, yes, it is. And I have titles for that if you need. That's funny. Excellent. Uh, cool. Well, this was super fun. It was also just fun to see you all again. Um, makes me feel like I'm. Yeah, it's meeting. great to. You know, it's been been a while since we've chatted, uh, Isaac, and and hopefully we'll have you back in the mix soon to collaborate on some cool stuff. And Artem, yeah. we miss you, buddy. It's uh, you know, it's been been too long, but I hope uh, I hope life is treating you well. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you everybody for stopping by on both of the streams. Um, it's been it's been super fun to have you all. Thanks for all the questions. And this will be up on YouTube, you know, sometime next week if you want to watch it there. Uh, but yeah, I think that's a a good spot to wrap. Cool. Yeah. See thank you next you time. Everybody.